Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Trade Talk. I'm your host, Nico, and this is episode 22. Uh, Once again, just a quick little update at the start of the show here. Uh, Our upcoming holiday schedule, with the holidays coming up, we we will be taking a little break uh, period and our last scheduled episode will be our next episode uh, episode 23 which will be released on Saturday December 21st and we will be returning uh, in the new year on uh, Saturday January 4th so yes yeah, so th- this is our second last show and for whenever you're hearing this and then episode 23 will be released on the 21st of december our last show of the new year and then we'll be returning to our regular scheduled programming on saturday january 4th for episode 24 okay so and uh if you have listened uh, to this show this past uh year uh, since I have started it, thank you. I just wanted to s- give a quick shout out to anybody that has kind of uh, tuned in to listen to me review these books. It's been fun for me to talk about something that I enjoy and kind of keep me on track and get my thoughts out there while they're still fresh and kind of give me a better idea of whether or not I, I, I like some of this stuff that I read as well because I read so much of it sometimes uh you know it's you know on to the shelf and on to the next thing but this has been a, a good way of kind of processing my thoughts uh you know on the spot after having read something within a week's time so it's been nice for me as well and uh thank you for everybody who has tuned in once again all right without further ado though let's get into the books i read this past week i got four different books to talk about today uh, the first up, we got Rumble Volume 6. This is published by Image Comics. This is written by uh, John Arcudi, art by David Rubin, and colors by Dave Stewart. And Volume 6 is entitled Last Night. And this collects issues 11 to 17. I guess this is a Volume 2 of Rumble. Uh, by uh, The reason I say that is because there was like another 15 issues or so prior to these ones. And that is collected in volumes one to three of Rumble. And that was with its original artist uh, that helped co-create this book um, along with John Arcudi, uh, James Heron. I'm a huge fan of James Heron's work. Uh, He's such an amazing artist. And I am also a big fan of David Rubin who came in for these last three collected volumes as the main series artist. Uh, Just two totally different styles art styles both great artists um but i will say i was a little disappointed when james heron left the book because i think i think he was the better out of the two for this particular title um and after he had left it kind of had left that impression on me um so it just never kind of was the same since then so this second go around for this series has been enjoyable but i will say uh, when james heron was on the book it was at its best um but again big fan of david rubin so uh, you know if you're gonna have anybody else come in and replace him i was happy with it it's just different uh different feel uh and look to the book he uh david rubin brought even compared to some of the other things david rubin has done i mean you can tell it's stylized like it looks like it looks like david rubin um but it's it, it's he's one of those artists i think that whichever book he's doing he slightly changes his style a bit even though you can kind of still tell it that it is him like this book for example is much cartoonier looking than some of the other things i've read by him i find um at least to me like a lot of um uh, you know the cartooning in this the look of the characters um that he draws in this world is not as um i don't know not as serious looking uh, as some of the other things i've seen him do um yeah like his, like his figure work is like smaller and his characters look i don't know just very much more animated than some of his other stuff that i've seen um so yeah, so at least that's the feel that I get from it. and But the art's still very enjoyable. I really liked it. And basically in this issue uh, of, uh, sorry, this arc of Rumble, um, you know, the gang's doing what it does best. They're getting attacked by monsters in the city. And Rathrak, the guy who's uh, the warrior who's been basically uh, cursed to be like in this scarecrow body, 
Um, if you ever ever seen anything about Rumble, like it's like this ancient warrior that's like put into this body of a scarecrow. Um, you know, and he used to be a real badass, but now he's uh, doomed to basically be in this husk, like a, this, like you know, this this actual scarecrow. <laughs> and so it's like even seeing him kind of run around with a sword and kind of fight people as a visual is pretty entertaining. Um, and and then like a lot of the time, these guys, it's like bad, you know, um, good versus evil. Um, and it's about a you know a guy and and a girl and and his best friend and Rathrak who's inside of this uh, the scarecrow body and it, you know there's all these creatures called the Isu and it's and and in this like there's it's a battle of the gods essentially like they start getting attacked in the town overrun by you know weird occurrences and monsters and shit that normally happens in this book but one of like um, one of the gods ends up helping them take down these other gods um, that are basically wreaking havoc. And it's like one of those things where it's almost like feels like seven, like, <laughs> like the seven deadly sins type thing. Like they face somebody that's like pestilence in this book. And like one of the gods that helps them take them down, like he's just made of like fire. And what's the other one? Like one of them basically touches you and you end up like disappearing and one of them is um one of them's like rot you know like disease like oh is that or is that the pestilence one uh, yeah there's a there's a couple of different uh, different versions of these gods i think i think the the just because of the pestilence thing i it's it's not like seven like it's not like all the seven deadly sins but there is dif different gods with different powers that are wreaking havoc in the town so Maybe a bad example in that sense, but um, but then you know it turns out the guy that was helping them was basically just doing it so he can kind of get the throne and and hell or wherever the hell he ends up at the end here. Like he he basically just helps them take them out so he can kind of uh, have dominance over over um, people and so he kind of put himself in in a position by the end where it looked like he had sacrificed himself to save them but really all he did was end up taking out the final god there and, and basically now running the shit like wherever he ends up at the end there so um so it's pretty interesting and i'm looking forward it doesn't i mean it says at the end at the end of this and the fact that they did two issues at the end of this and brought in guest artists made me think that maybe this was the end of the series but i don't think it is because it didn't feel like a proper ending so i'm i wouldn't be surprised if there ends up being more but uh but yeah this has been a fun series through image comics i mean john arcudi uh you know did a lot of work over dark horse best known for i think his involvement with uh you know hellboy and bprd and stuff working with mike mignola so see him work with these artists over here on this book this creator own title and uh similar i guess in tone to something like a like a hellboy in the sense like uh the all like the monsters and the and you know the uh hell uprising and all this kind of shit that that feels like it's going on within this arc it was uh you know, it, it's a good fit for him, I find. And then the last two issues, issues 16 and 17, I mean, issue 17 especially. Like, look at the uh, artist on issue 16 is a guy named Alex Horley. He does one story, Metej Stick. Metej, and then his last name Stick. Uh, it, it, it does a story. And then my favorite of the issue is Gerardo Zafino, who's excellent. He did a couple of fill-in issues on Jason Aaron Aaron's Conan. Uh, the barbarian this past year he's he's amazing and then and then issue 17 you get a story by andrew mclean of head lopper who i love and then you get james Air heron returning to the book which is excellent because and they basically just kind of did like a like a switch off like like um andrew mclean brought head lopper into this world like so and because it was head lopper and it, it, this was it, they ended up using rathrak like him not in the scarecrow body like him like as a like the ancient warrior um that he is 
because he's so similar, um, you know, to, I guess, like somebody like Headlop or it made, it made perfect sense. And they kind of switched off and did a continuing story from one artist to the other. And I love both of these guys art and their creations with Rumble and Headlopper. So this, that was a, that was a fantastic little issue. I mean, that's a no brainer to get those two guys together. And the fact that Headlopper showed up in this book, more creator own uh, characters should, should do that more often, but only when it's right. Like I wouldn't like to see it overdone, but things like this, this was like a special little fun move. Right. And then the last artist on that was Gonzalo Ruggeri, who I'm not as familiar with, but the highlight of that issue was those, uh, those two uh so yeah uh rumble check it out if you have never uh you never have i think it's definitely a, a series i don't think that's talked about enough uh with fantastic art talent and it's a pretty fun little story so if it sounds interesting to you definitely check it out there's six volumes out now um but yeah i mean even just pick up the first one like i said it, it is a continuing story from art, one artist to the next but the first three volumes are done with one. The, f the last three, four to six uh, volumes uh, are with another one. All right. So uh, next up, we got Kabuki. This is Kabuki Omnibus Volume 1. This is being re-released now in these paperback Omnibus editions. Previously, they were brought on those oversized hardcover library editions through Dark Horse Comics, collecting a lot of the old Kabuki material. This is, of course, by artist David Mack. Uh, frequent collaborator with the Brian Michael Bendis, you might know him best for. But this is of his older series that he did. He wrote and drew called Kabuki, and I had never read this before. I didn't pick up the library editions when they came out because those were the big, expensive, oversized hardcovers. And even though I love that format, and I love his work, I, like his artwork, so I may have missed the boat on that. Maybe I should have picked them up initially, but. For these paperback omnibuses that are coming out now, this is a that's a hell of a deal. I mean, this retails at twenty nine ninety nine US um, for this first volume. Um, it collects the first two complete Kabuki volumes in this, so it's a fat it's a fat thick trade. I mean, these little omnibus editions that they do in paperback, Dark Horse, like you, you know, I dare you to find better bang for your buck in terms of value out on the market today. Uh, especially, you know, with comics and the fucking fact that like series uh, companies like Marvel and stuff will sell you like this for the same price. You'll get like, I don't know, like an, an eight issue paperback or something of an event for like $30, right? And the hardcover is 50. So, <laughs> you know, something ridiculous like that. So the fact is, is like a fat thick paperback where you're getting like, and that's why they're calling it the omnibus editions of this Kabuki. Um, you know, you're getting a lot of material in here. Like we're talking about a few hundred pages, uh, I don't have a page count right now, but yeah, it's a it's a few hundred pages for sure. Um, anyways, uh, so yeah, I I'd never read this before. Uh, I would say I liked the first half better than the second half of this. Uh, I don't know if anybody you guys have watched the cartoonist kayfabe channel with Ed Pisker and uh, Jim Rugg, two comic creators. That's been very popular this past year. They started a channel called Cartoonist Kayfabe. Um, on YouTube and also they have the audio on podcasts as well, but the YouTube videos are what you want to watch for that. Uh, they talk about all things comics and they, a, lot, a big theme that they've been talking about this past year are, uh, what they call outlaw comics, which are essentially bl black and white comics from like, you know, the late eighties, early nineties during that time period where a lot of people had their own black and white comics after the boom of like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and stuff like that. And then a lot of them had like a lot of like the aesthetic and theme of um, not only just being black and white, but some of the themes and content of said comics, um, you know, in a way to describe them would be like, you know, hard th hitting themes like with people with guns and violence and, and sex and fucking just basically – um, you know, like a more mature title and, and the art itself being black and white and just being very, uh, detailed artwork as well. And a lot of the time, right. Not always, but it's, you know, and, and, and if you want any more explanation of that, just, you know, if I'm not doing it justice, take a look at the channel and, uh, and see, or, you know, uh, Google or go on YouTube and search for outlaw comics, cartoonist kayfabe. They have a video where they show a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different, uh, comics that are basically of that genre, or, 
um, type. And the this first half of this Kabuki paperback, this Omnibus Volume 1, this feels very outlaw comics. Like, you also got, like, there's a bad girl era of, com- era of comics, which has sexy, you know, uh, heroines who, uh, you know, kill people, but uh, over-sexualize the whole time. And, and this first half is him uh, doing all black and white artwork with basically that 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 like that's what she is she's a badass chick this kabuki chick she wears the kabuki mask she walks around with these like tools that used to be part of the ainu culture which i know from reading the manga golden uh kamui i believe it's pronounced uh that i really love i've talked about on the show before uh the ainu or like another people of the japanese people um, you know, their culture is a little bit different, even though they lived in Japan, I guess they were pushed up to another part of, I think it's Northern Japan or so, or something, if I'm not mistaken. And, and, uh, they have their own kind of ways of life and, you know, they're, they're a farming, uh, community. And so she uses like these like scythe type, <laughs> like, like the circular ones, not like where it's like a big, like uh grim reaper type scythe, but the one where it's like, uh, like a hat, like a crescent moon type fucking blade that they use to, I guess, cut down corn stalks and, and shit like that, or wheat sheath, sorry. So one of those, if you've seen one of those type of um, weapons before, she's got like two of them, and she works for the secret society of like a bunch of different of the women that are all deadly assassins and were trained as such, and they, they go up against the government, and there's like, I guess, several of them that all have different names and identities and just badass weapons, and they make meat in secret, and they're like, it's a secret society, so it just feels very outlaw, like a lot of the themes the aesthetic, the look of it, the black and white, the obsession that went into this artwork, like this feels like that. And, uh, and I really dug that because I was not expecting that from this book. Like I thought this was going to be more about like Japanese culture and this kind of thing, at least from the impression I got of this title. And he actually wrote this, uh, a couple of interesting things about David Mack is that he wrote this, uh, he started he did this at age 21 and it was for his university thesis in literature and that is what the first half of this book collects so the fact that he did all these little short stories or this ongoing narrative like this comic and and, and submitted it for that it's just like it's it's and he was 21 and this is probably like some of his earliest work it looks great it, it like even now it stands up and you know you get that letter at the start of this paperback from david max saying that he can see all the flaws and he's gotten much better and this and that and you know although he likes he he still enjoys it because you could see like just the energy or the enthusiasm that he brought to it on the page and just like you know obviously he's gotten better but uh you you know you, you, you like it's it's something about like early work you, you can kind of or at least what he was going through at the time he his mother also was dying towards the end of him finishing that book and he kind of touches on that within the story and ties that in as well and he actually even does a little thing where he kind of says to his mother at the end of it ida mac i think it was her name but uh so yeah really really great stuff and then the second half you kind of get into what i more so know david mack for from some of the things that i've seen him do with bendis is his painting style like he paints like a whole bunch of um like the other second half of about the uh, this book is just beautiful painted work that he does but in so in doing so i think he lost some of the actual narrative like some of the good storytelling that he was doing Although, you know, uh, preachy at times, a little in, in quite, um, you know, hard to get through, I think, some of the reading experience, even in the first bit, the first half with the black and white stuff, um, you know, it's it, it's kind of, it wasn't, it didn't read fantastic, but there was a lot of interesting visuals and things going on to kind of keep me going through it, uh, you know, so this second half was like beautiful painted artwork but it was mainly him just throwing out like words on the page like to describe feelings or like to move the story along if you even want to call it that and you know and and it was mostly just about the art i think that it lost something in the story the second painted half like i can't even tell you what the fuck i was reading or what happened in this second half but it was a visual treat so overall i really enjoyed this first volume um you know it's definitely worth trying out but i 
thinking, at least from what I've seen, the future work moving forward now with this painted style, I believe it's more of that as opposed to what that first half was. And that kind of is a little disappointing because I would really dig it more if he did that first half, like that kind of style, as opposed to this other second half with the painted style. And, and you know, again, um, it's mainly to do with like the storytelling he combines with the painted style. And it's like a lot of mixed media type stuff going on. You can obviously see um you know i mean if they were even doing work at that time for himself to compare it to actually well it must have been if it was early 90s like dave mckean right off the bat you can look you can see you can look at this and say yeah he must have been inspired by him and obviously bill sinkevich like these are two guys that i think you can say are all, all, all both in the same wheelhouse in terms of all the different types of styles and uh, flavor they can bring to their art the david mack has the same type of skill set as they those guys do and that's high praise so it's a it's a very interesting looking book um story wise it's okay so i mean if you're i would say it, they're worth checking out in this format because of the amount of content you get for this price in these paperback omnibus volumes and i will be continuing with it but i will say if you're looking for um, you know, this isn't, like I said, it's not the best story. So if you're looking for something more meatier to kind of sink your teeth into, that's going to tell you a well-rounded story, this may not be for you. But if you're looking for some interesting uh, art to look at, um, especially this first half, where the story was fun, I would say, but then, you know, not as good towards the end, um, definitely check this out. Okay, uh, next up, we got Pearl. Uh, speaking of Brian Michael Bendis, this is volume two of Pearl. This is through his Jinx World imprint, which is now over at DC Comics. This is with him and artist Michael Gatos. Uh, this finishes off the series of Pearl that he did. Uh, this is issues seven to 12. I, uh, I I ended up enjoying this. I liked it. This is like when he went over to DC Comics, he brought a bunch of like creator owned stuff with him too, which he hadn't done in a long time. So it was really cool to see that he like launched four different titles under the Jinx World imprint when he went over there with artists that he is good friends with and he's worked with a lot in the past, you know, Alex Maleev and and uh, Michael Gatos. And I think, uh, I think David Mack did. I think that was him on cover, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, I think he also did something with them, and uh, and what's his name, um, the guy that did United States of Murder Inc. with him, Mike, Michael Avon Oming. So all great artists. Um, I, I got to say though, Michael Gatos, he kind of changed his style up a little bit for this. I mean, Michael Gatos famously was the artist on Jessica Jones or Alias, as it was called back in the day. Uh, before she kind of became a big character on TV. Uh, um, he did with Brian Michael Bendis. And his style has changed somewhat, at least in this. Like, it, like it's not as dark with the inks and the shadow work. And I think it's it's definitely more... Like, if you thought he was photo referency before, this is more photo referency, I find. And I don't. I didn't love it at parts. Like, and and the thing about Michael Gatos is, I mean, he's done this before, but I think it was never more so apparent, at least to me, in this book, the, in Pearl, uh, in this particular volume. When I just read it, maybe that's now I'm more aware of it. Like, if I went back and read Alias now, maybe I would feel this way about it too. It's very distracting, though, is the fact that he does that shit where like he'll put a panel and he'll copy that same panel. So, like, you'll see the character in one panel. It'll be a nice panel, but then, like, something will happen, and then, like, he'll want to get... He'll do the same panel for, like, three panels in a row, and they'll just have word bubbles coming out of it, but it's literally the same expression and pose and scene that you're looking at. And it really takes me out of it when somebody does that. It's like, you know, just Photoshopping in the fucking... Or, or however, you know, they, these guys do it digitally, like, not Photoshop, but you know what I mean? Like, they, they basically are just using the same image um more than once and it's just lazy to me i find like yes you can use the same image if it, it works in the same sense like or the same degree in the same scene 
and I've seen other people do it, but they do it better than this for whatever reason. And this I found very distracting. I think it's maybe because also the look of his art. So it's, you know, it's like a, I'm sure a good time saver or, or, you know, he justifies it by for whatever reason. Um, but for me as a reader, it was very distracting at times. And also I didn't like the the look of the artwork a lot of the time in this. Some interesting stuff, but I think that his work looks different here, and I actually prefer what he was doing with Jessica Jones' alias time period, although that was so long ago. I can't blame the guy for trying to grow as an artist, and there is some nice-looking things in here, but then others, not so much. So I don't know if it was more of him just changing up his style to get this book out on time. Uh, but yeah, no, I just, I didn't find it very pleasing to the eye, uh, a lot of the time, but the story itself, also kind of ridiculous, <laughs> it's about this tattoo artist who her mother used to be part of the Yakuza, and then in this, like, she finds all this out in the first volume, you know, falls in love with a guy, she got, like, this tattoo on her face that, you know is mostly hidden but then when she gets angry or emotional or something like that it actually appears brighter on her skin uh but she's like albino like kind of, kind of uh, like her, her skin tone so um it, it's interesting and and just the look the visual look of the character and the way she was written and how you get introduced to the character all interesting stuff she falls in love with a boy and they're both tattoo artists and like and then they're they're kind of thrown into kind of the underworld of this kind of stuff and then she finds out this past her past her mother's past and how she kind of like ran shit a little bit in the yakuza which is kind of unheard of for a woman and that in that culture and in gang type stuff and then in this she basically has to step up and she goes to japan and she kind of she asserts herself into this full on like gangster yakuza type situation where by the end of it She's like now like <laughs> running shit in LA or wherever they are, like or Portland, because I know they're in Portland for some of this, because Ben this is from Portland, of course. But like she's like asserted herself as this, you know, huge this badass by the end of this who made like, made all these kind of moves and, and has like put herself in a position of power where they're like restructuring things and and doing it for her own generation of like younger people that live in that town. So she's like but you know but like it just it just felt too quick like something for something like that to develop you really gotta like <laughs> give in to this story and it's kind of ridiculous at times although it was kind of charming as well i found like you kind of got that whole little love story with her and the guy that she likes in this and uh and some of the dialogue worked really well it was good bendis dialogue and it was a creator owned project with him with somewhat interesting art so i dug it i don't know i just the feeling i got by the end of it was i enjoyed myself i enjoyed the experience of reading it but i feel that if i as you can tell if you can you could slowly pick apart a bunch of things that were wrong with this that would make other creator owned stories by bendis far superior to this one so it's not his strongest work by far but i am a fan and if you are a fan i think it's worth checking out um because it wasn't bad it just wasn't his strongest work because it's a bit of a fucking stretch at times this story but fun and charming um so yeah i definitely would check it out i wouldn't rush to go check it out unless like i said you're a big bendis fan um uh, but i think that if you can find it cheap or you know, you know, even if you got a library that you can go to that has the volumes of this, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a fun, quick read for sure. All right, and then last up today, I got Birthright Volume Eight. This is written by Joshua Williamson, art by, uh, what the hell is this dude's name? Sorry, Andre Bresson and Adriano Lucas on colors. Um, Birthright was a series I used to read in issues and then I felt that it was going at too slow of a pace that I wanted to start reading it in bigger chunks so I switched to trade on it and this is one of like Joshua Williamson I mean this is eight volumes in this collects issues 36 to 40 um, and, and I mean it still seems like he can get a couple more volumes out of this story at the at the pace and, that he's going and, and it seems to be like a lot more story to tell that he could do still um, this has been an enjoyable one this is basically about a kid his father um, you know he had him and his brother uh, his two sons out one day and one of them wandered off and 
and uh and he was you know i guess struggling with his marriage and sh- well no i think everything was happy at that time and then when he had lost his son i guess he was maybe a little negligent and he lost his son his son wandered off and then he got transported to this fantasy world and in that world he essentially aged and became this crazy warrior conan like esque type warrior and over a short period of time because time you know is different in that world and then his marriage fell apart because he lost his son and everyone just thought that he got kidnapped or that he he was the one who killed him and it basically had him and his wife at um go at each other and and basically you know all the cops were looking into him and seeing if he did something with his son and it was kind of just like a whole bunch of shit went wrong very quickly for this guy and then the kid had a kid brother so anyways years later he ends up coming back out of this fantasy world back to earth um there you know there's some portal that that they get open and they're able to cross back over and then uh his father's like you know like was just his life was ruined so he's like a basket case when he comes back but then he's like oh my god like you know he, he connects with him he's like oh my god you're my son like everyone didn't believe me so now they'll believe me and things will get better again and meanwhile his brother um you know he's much older than his brother and his brother was the older brother before he went away but now like he came back and he's like this major badass and then basically the reason why it's called birthright i guess you could say is that then you find out that this this kid's father his father they were like which i guess was unbeknownst to him up to this point they he he was like a sorcerer or mage or some shit like that he's like some guy that was part of a bunch of people humans that years ago had made this connection with this like magic fantasy world like this other i guess you know plane of existence dimension type shit where where um and and they closed off um access to this place but meanwhile it's like apparently in this guy's blood and all all of a sudden all of them are somehow wrapped up in this crazy story and going back and forth to this fantasy world and their own and within this volume that that door finally came down and now the worlds are like the other world is accessible to earth so all this crazy shit is coming through the door at the end of this and it's been it's been a good mix of fun action fantasy adventure type story along with family drama this whole way through so eight volumes in still very enjoyable the artist is an artist i wasn't familiar with and the series started but really good for this book perfect fit for this book draws all the fantasy aspects really interesting uh you know this is an, another this through the skybound imprint robert kirkman's books over at image comics if you're a fan of joshua williamson this is one of his earliest creator owned stuff i guess he started it with nailbiter over at image comics around the same time as well so definitely worth checking out for that reason too uh but yeah i mean to be honest it it dragged a little bit in the middle i mean in the middle volumes of these past eight volumes but these last couple of volumes that came out as uh is got me super interested to check it out every time it comes back out another volume at this point like these last couple have been fantastic and and so i so was this particular volume volume eight i really ended up enjoying it so it kind of it dipped in uh you know it, it got a little slow there for a little bit for me and that's probably around the time i stopped reading it in issues but I think now uh, I'm looking forward to him wrapping this up and bringing it home, hopefully within the next couple. All right, though, guys, that will do it for this week, and we'll see you guys next week for our last show of the year. Take care.